So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Welcome to Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 142, just for you. My name is Frederick Dunn, and this is the way to be. I'm so glad that you're here today. It is 26 degrees Fahrenheit outside and getting colder into the weekend, and it is minus 3 Celsius. So before we even get started today, I know some of you are like, Hey, Freddie, you're going to do a recap of the Hive Life conference down in Tennessee that you just got back from? Yeah, I am. But I have to do it on a separate video. So it's going to be separate from the Q&A. So if you're expecting to see some details about the Hive Life conference hosted by Cayman Reynolds down in Tennessee, uh, that's not in this video. These are strictly questions today. And I also want to thank Guardian Bee Apparel. Links will be down in the video description below. Uh, for sponsoring me down there at the Hive Life Conference. Had a great time. We'll talk about that a lot uh, later on. So, the video description has all the topics that we're going to cover today, and they're in order. So, for those of you who are hunting through to find out what's going to be covered in this really long video, uh, look at those. The other thing is, after it gets posted, Adam Holmes usually puts the timestamps, and that will be the pinned comment down in the comment section below. So for those of you who submitted your questions, there's a lot of questions this week uh, because last week, surprise, surprise, I posted uh, early and it launched on Friday, but I was at the conference. So two things were happening at one time, but I only did about a 45 minute presentation. So I'm trying to catch up today. This is also a podcast. If you can't stand to look at it, but you want to hear it, Podbean, the way to be. And lots of links, as I mentioned down below, let's jump right into today's topic which is starting with number one from Peter Jenny, Sheridan, Wyoming. Fred, can I store extracted honey in the plastic buckets that are sold at big box stores like Home Depot, or do I have to purchase food grade buckets? Okay, when it comes to plastic buckets for storing your honey after you've extracted it, always, always try to get food grade buckets because all plastics are not created equal. And that doesn't mean that the home centers like Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever the local building center is that you go to, it doesn't mean they don't have food grade buckets. They're not very expensive, so I would go with food grade always. The other thing is you want to keep it in those buckets for the lowest amount of time possible. So once your honey settles and everything in there, you want to get them out and into your final jars and in the final containers just as quick as you can because the last thing you want to happen is for your honey to set or crystallize inside those buckets and then you have to warm things up and there's something else about plastic when it gets really hot it can uh, be altered you ever get in a car on a hot summer day and uh, smell all of the plastics in your car the dash and everything else the only reason you can smell it is because tiny particles are in the air and they allow you to smell it so Food grade, absolutely don't go with regular paint buckets and things like that. It was interesting at the conference, Tom Benny, a big time beekeeper, uh, commented that plastics uh, actually get liberated into the honey, that the honey can etch some of it. So I don't think all plastics are created equal. Word of caution on that. Food grade, always. If it's going to be in contact with your honey that you're ultimately going to consume. Question number two. Uh, this is from Aaron McLean. I'm a second year beekeeper and plan on expanding this year to about 10 hives from a single hive. It seems that so much of the beekeeping involves drawn comb, and I'd love to know what I can do to maximize their wax production. From what I gather, it involves thin syrup, but I'd love to hear your thoughts and strategies. Thank you so much. Okay, well, comb is... Everyone in beekeeping is going to tell you drawn honeycomb is the most precious thing to the bees. It takes the most resources for the bees to produce it. And yes, the thinner syrups, and these are not hard and fast formulas, but the pretty widely accepted standard for brood buildup and for the energy in spring when they're doing comb production and wax works and things like that is one-to-one -one syrup. Maybe even a, a lower concentration of sugar syrup, but you're trying to match what they're getting, the sucrose that they get from the flowers themselves. So that's what does it. But the other thing is it's stimulated by the temperature, stimulated by 
Uh, you would have a queen in the colony. You would have brood that's actively developing because all these things stimulate your wax building bees to do what they do. They can't do it in really cold temperatures. So you wouldn't, for example, temperatures we have outside right now at 26 degrees Fahrenheit, there wouldn't be any wax production going on in a hive. So there are lots of stimulation that there are stimulating factors that all come together to cause your bees to make new comb, new wax comb. But if you're in a hurry, and by the way, at the conference, Better Bee was represented there. And you might have seen this. This is Better Comb. So this is pre-drawn synthetic wax. So when you're a brand new beekeeper and you're starting out and you want to get your bees off to a fast start, uh, having this better comb in your hive and some people always ask should i just fill the whole hive should i have 10 of these no i recommend two or three right in the middle and then your other frames go outboard of that and then your bees will build out the rest on their own but better comb is the fastest way i know of to stock a hive with drawn cells and you'll notice too that when bees Get in production uh, when it's a good strong colony of bees. If you have a nucleus colony and they're expanding and the nectar flow is coming on and everything else and everything is sunny and happy, um, they build wax remarkably fast. So you have to expand space for the bees to build that wax ahead of that production because they can also be shut down. For example, if you've got your deep brood box and in spring they're in a state of rapid buildup, You'll see that if you have a medium super over that, they can fill that really fast. And once they cap the cells in that, and once they fill all those frames, it's almost like a honey cap that can actually slow down production. And then the population of the bees build up, and now we risk swarming. And the reason I mentioned swarming, too, is because some of you will be starting your beekeeping adventures this spring with a brand new swarm a prime swarm hopefully in spring that maybe some other beekeeper collected for you. They consume as much of the honey as they can. You'll see in a swarm that they'll even have pollen on their legs so it's a mixed bag of foragers. It's got you've got wax producers in there, you've got the queen of course that leaves the hive and they are maxed out in resources. That's why when they get put into a new box or if they're left in a swarm trap for a period of days and aren't collected out of the trap right away, you'll see they'll start to build that fresh white new beeswax comb right away and they do that remarkably fast. So the way to stimulate them is you keep the feed on all the time. Now here's another thought on that while we're talking. So the feeders that we're mentioning now in spring if you put feed on the amount of feed and the consistency of the feed availability also play. So this is that new tankard. I showed it in the last video. There's a blue top. This is much stronger. These come from Be Smart Design and they just came out and they're just now available by the way. But what I want you to notice is this for example could have a full gallon of one-to-one -one syrup on it. You just hived a new swarm or you're just getting started with a package of bees, something like that. And then you have a hole in the top of the inner cover, which most inner covers have, or some people have migratory covers, which sit on top of the hive, and you can have a small hole in that too. And then look at the tiny feeding area in this, the little spuds, the holes in the middle here. This will keep the feed, the syrup will be available to the bees constantly, but it doesn't flood them with resources. Only so many bees can get this at a time. So instead of a big feeder with lots of surface area where they move lots of syrup in a very short amount of time, this is very different. This is more of a trickle feeder, you would call it. The other thing is I recommend um, when you put that in there that you make sure that they just don't run out. So when they have a constant resource like that, they tend to build infrastructure. But if it comes in a flood, then they're filling their cells or they're flooding cells and storing uh, really wet nectar in spring that when they need those cells for bee production. So they need brood production. So we have to be careful too not to cause a honey bound situation in spring. So on those cold rainy days when we get when they can't continue to bring in the resources from outside if you have a feeder like this inside surrounded by a medium box 
it will provide a constant resource right at the top, right where it's easy for them to get to it. So these are new, they just came out, and uh, they don't sag, they don't squish down the way the older versions did. <clears throat> so that's another way to do it. So space to grow, nutritional resources, and the climate, right? Queen, right? Because in the absence of a queen, they often stop doing uh, wax production. So they don't invest in a space uh, where they may be in jeopardy of actually uh, departing or just dwindling away and dying off. Question number three, John Jones, Coopville, Washington, says that I know hives should be positioned where it will get the morning sunlight to encourage the workers to start their day early. But I'm wondering if it is the heat from the sun or the light through the entrance that prompts the activity. I'm putting a lands hive in my backyard and the best sun spot would put their entrance right where I would pass by and work. Thus, I'm thinking rotating the Hive 180 to face the wall. Suitable idea. Um, so it's not just that the hives don't work well if their landing boards are facing a specific way. Uh, they just tend to improve. So you can have, and I have them facing all directions. Why? Because I want to know uh, if one does better than the other, if one flies earlier than the other. So I have a horseshoe-shaped configuration through one of my bee yards. And uh, so I have landing boards facing north, east, south, southeast, and west. And this way I can see who's flying early. This is nothing better than to go out in your beehive and stare at bees and sip your coffee or your tea or whatever you drink and pay a lot of attention to who's doing what at what time of day. And then... Those are entries you put in your log books. So it actually is an improvement. If you want your bees to fly earlier, they do that with south and southeast facing entrances, statistically. So if you've got an entrance facing north, uh, the only drawback is that it doesn't get sun this time of year, for example. Like, you know, we're at 26 degrees Fahrenheit, that's wicked cold, and if we get a sun blast all of a sudden, let's say the clouds clear, and we just get an hour or so of good sunlight here in the wintertime, and you've got south-facing colonies, those get the melt off of the snow first. And of course, those sun rays do go through the entrance somewhat, but I don't think that's that meaningful. I think that the landing board being warmed and the snow melting off and of course the entrance area being warm. So if it's warming the back side of the hive, uh, I think what you'll find if you flipped them and we've got the, the landing boards and the entrances facing north, for example, here in the state of Pennsylvania, then you would find that the cluster inside the hive on those warming days tend to move to the south side of the hive and to the eastern corner of the hive as the cluster gets smaller through the winter time. So there are other dynamics going on in there. So if the entrance were faced that way, then that cluster would be migrating, of course, to the side of the hive directly over the entrance. Uh, but the sun coming in itself, I don't know. I think it's primarily the, the warmth and the, just the heat from that exposed side. So, but you can certainly do it and you don't want your entrance. I did this with my observation hive. The entrance comes right out the side of the building. It's a little inch and a half diameter hole and it's got a little deck that they land on and then a little of course cover board over the top of it and uh, for lack of foresight I put that entrance right where everybody walks by and it's very inconspicuous so having an entrance right where you're gonna walk past it is not a great idea most of the time the bees don't care but let's say it's one of those times of year where they're a little angsty and there's stuff going on and they're stressed that's when somebody walks by and if it's a three or four year old, they're head high to that entrance for that observation hive. So the next ones uh, won't have entrances facing walkways. Another option is to have either a physical barrier, but then you know it's, it's not as much fun for us because we can't look at the bees. But you can have a tube that goes up like a snorkel just over uh, head height and the bees of course fly out up above. You could have an entrance channel. Of course, it comes up under the soffit of a building, that kind of thing. There are a lot of ways to rearrange the entrance so that uh, it can be out of pedestrian traffic. And uh, some people put stockade fences, barriers, and things like that around their hives. But if you're like me, 
I like to see them. And uh, so I hope that helps, but they'll still be fine with the north entrance. Uh, and keep your entrances clear this time of year, please. Don't let the dead bees build up. Question number four comes from Matt from Niagara, Wisconsin. Do you know of a healthy range for the rate of bees dying during winter? I am wintering my first colony and noticed that during the first couple of months of winter, I was cleaning out and or finding several dozen dead bees per week, and now there are only 15 to 30 every two weeks. So let me, there's two parts to this question, so let me answer that one first. Uh, you know how I, I'm happier when I go outside in the snow on a sunny morning and I see a spattering of dead bees on the snow. I know the hive's alive. And you can also look at the snow and see if they're leaving little brown spots or if the snow is clear. And this is interesting too. The colonies that have the hive alive on them are not uh, putting out little smatterings of tan so much as the straight sugar does. So, and I can't make that a solid correlation with that, but when I see dead bees in the snow, I know that's a colony that's alive. A lot of new beekeepers uh, get alarmed when they see 20 or 30 dead bees or they see them actively dying in the snow and things like that. You have to consider that the bees' lives are not longer in winter. Uh, we have the winter bees, the fat-bodied winter nurse bees, let's call them, that will live for months and they're little miracles. But aside from those, we also have foragers that are in the hive and we have normal worker bees that are in the hive. And what you don't normally see when you have warm days, this is why people down in the south probably don't see it a lot, you don't accumulate a bunch of dead bees right in front because those bees that are at the end of their natural life fly away and just don't come back. So you don't see a pile of dead bees in front of the hive. So it's dramatic for some people. Now, if you're seeing hundreds of bees in a pile in front of your hive, you might have a varroa problem that, that brought a bunch of disease and they're dying out heavy by the score. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it would be normal for a few hundred bees a day to die in a normal time of year. In winter, those numbers dwindle and they're in a state of torpor, but they die and fall on the bottom, so they don't have the opportunity to fly out and fly away. That's why when you do your spring inspections for the first time, those who have never done this before, uh, when you look at your bottom boards, for example, you may find hundreds, if not thousands, of dead bees piled up on the bottom board, which is why, oh man, I don't have it. It's so critical that you keep your entrances clear of the dead bees, because they are dying. That can be normal. And what really matters in your hive, what really indicates their overall health is hopefully that that cluster is remaining sizable, that there's enough bees to do multiple tasks at once and stay warm and rear brood and gradually move up into the hive while they're consuming the resources in there. And I also hope that you've put emergency resources on. But if we're seeing 15 to 30 every two weeks, not bad at all. And don't forget to collect them if you want to and inspect those bees, inspect those dead bees. So, inspect them for what, Fred? Well, you can look for mites, although the mites would likely clamor off of those bees and onto a healthy bee body if they're in there. You can do nosema inspections. You could otherwise just look at their general state of uh, health. You can look at how what they have all their feet their abdomens are normal size or if they're shrunk up and truncated which could indicate starving if their abdomens are really small if their abdomens are nice and large and they just died they could just die of old age it would be natural to see that their wings are tattered for the older bees uh, we don't want them to be super wet if we can collect the dying bees you want to see if they're bald for example and uh, i'm going to mention a guide later on today that will help you diagnose problems with your bees and most people don't have microscopes. I did ask a lot of people at the convention if they owned microscopes and things like that so they could do their own nosema checks. Microscopes are always handy. So uh, you can evaluate dead bees. They're dead and done anyway. Great thing to do. Number two, it says that uh, this is for question four still, two parts. 
I've heard or read somewhere that oxalic acid vaporization should be done during temperatures above 35 degrees Fahrenheit. Do you know why that might be? I recently did my first such treatment with a temperature in the mid-20s because I do one in winter and it is unlikely to get above freezing here between December and March. Thanks. So it doesn't get above freezing between December and March. And you did one at 20 degrees. Well, there are a couple of things to think about. Well, several things to think about. But this oxalic acid vaporization delivery in the cold, what do we need the oxalic acid to do? We need it to sublimate. We need it to go freely into the hive and get on as many bee surfaces as possible. That's what it does. It settles in there. And uh, we also needed to get in on the nurse bees because that's where the varroa mites are likely to be hanging out, on the bodies of the nurse bees. And if there is brood and if there are varroa in your hive and there likely will be some percentage of varroa, then uh, they're also going to be inside the brood that is so critical in wintertime. And we really want to protect our fat-bodied winter nurse bees. So where are they? Well, they're in the center. They're on the brood. That is the most protected part of your hive in wintertime. So what's around them? Well, the bodies of foraging bees, the bodies of worker bees that are not nurse bees. And that whole mantle becomes very tight. And if you look at a video that I did this year of a storm swarm, a, a late season swarm that flew out, they clustered on a branch, they were all spread out on this branch. And I started videoing them because I knew a storm was coming in, the weather was going to change, and it was going to get much colder and windier. So what they did, instead of spreading out like this, they all move very close together, and they become tighter and tighter and tighter until all the bees are shoulder to shoulder, and they're layer by layer on top of one another. And this is how they protect who's in the middle of the swarm, the queen. So in the hive, the queen is also at the center of your cluster, the nurse bees, the queen's retinue, her attendants are in that center. And if the cluster is super tight as they are when it's really cold outside, the oxalic acid that you put into the hive to treat for mites is not going to make it into that protected cluster. That's why. That's why the temperature. The other thing is uh, you need that vapor to stay airborne. You need the oxalis to stay airborne as long as it can. And when it's really cold, of course, there's a different thermal dynamic inside the hive and it cools quicker and it settles faster. So I don't even do it at the, you know, the 35 degrees or whatever that's cited here. I know that's what it says on the actual apobioxal package that the oxalis comes in. But uh, I like to see it because I'm thinking in my mind all the time, where's the cluster? What's it doing? How effective is the treatment going to be? Did you hurt them by putting it in in the 20s? Probably not, but you also didn't do a very effective uh, treatment. So if they loosen up in the 60s, those warm days, and we see a lot of traffic going in and out there, uh, and then you give them a treatment then because they, they blow it all around themselves, which is pretty cool. And that's stuff that I've observed directly through glass. We put oxalic acid vapor, we sublimated the oxalic acid, and it blew into the hive and the bees circulated it until it went to every square inch of the hive. But if there were a cluster, they would be blowing it away trying to avoid getting it into the cluster. So, long answer on that. But the warmer it is, the better it's going to be. But I do understand we have phoretic mites, mites that are outside of those uh, pupa cells in wintertime because the capped pupa numbers are so small. Some places never are without brood here in the north. We do uh, get times when the brood is either very tiny or non-existent for cap brood, and that's a perfect time to hit them with oxalic acid, assuming we get one of those decent warm-up days when it could be most effective. So that's where that comes from. Number five, potato chimps. I was thinking about how many beekeepers build their beehives based on designs and materials that commercial beekeepers use, specifically pine boxes. Since I am limited to two hives in my county, I started thinking that I could build a monster horizontal hive. 
I could use more exotic materials like mahogany if I wanted something more akin to furniture and a garden focal point. Have you ever seen a beehive constructed from something like that? I know it is an almost absurdly expensive project, but mahogany is very weather resistant and I could carve it and it would be very sturdy if built properly to provide years of use. So potato champs is onto something that I actually like, not the mahogany part. I don't know that I would waste a lot of mahogany on a beehive. But what you can do, because the horizontal hive, the whole point of it, and this is something too I'm gonna to hit on when I talk about uh, the Hive Life Conference, the horizontal hives guy there, I went in and I beat it all the hives. I have stuff to say. So we're gonna look at that. And uh, here's why I like horizontal hives. Not the best configuration for the bees. Uh, because it's horizontal, it's not vertical. So anyway, will the bees survive in it? Sure they will. What are the advantages? The advantages are, after you build it, that it's accessible. You can have a wheelchair accessible horizontal hive. No one in a wheelchair is going to be able to lift vertical boxes off and tend to bees in a vertical configuration. So the horizontal hive provides that access. Elderly people, people that used to keep bees in their prime and they used to be able to lift everything and they were all stocky, uh, still want to keep bees, but they can't lift anymore. So instead of going to all mediums or shallow supers and things like that, the horizontal hive provides a convenient answer to that problem. And uh, if you're teaching about bees, uh, as I do, horizontal hives, you make them as long as you want, and then you have a staging area for your stuff. You have storage built in. This hive does not get moved. Therefore, you can build it as thick and heavy as you want it to be. And so I agree with that whole idea of making a monster horizontal hive. Just know that it's been my experience that they won't fill more than 30 frames. So the bees are, you know, unless you put a monster hive together, you know, I watched Cayman Reynolds put together his horizontal hive, and I think he pulled from two or three different bee boxes to put, you know, super amounts of brood in there to really create a giganto colony of bees. But if you're doing a normal colony with just a swarm install or something like that, the Langstroth Long Lang horizontal hive, to me, is the best configuration for the people that have already mentioned that have these limitations. And uh, because it's static, so I put a lot of thought into the support system for it. So I put angle iron more than three feet into the ground to take advantage of soil friction and soil compression to support what could be a very heavy hive. And this is even before the bees get in it. And yes, you can get honey out of them. They're not honey supercharged hives, but uh, just as with any other configuration, they store their honey away from the entrance. So... A nice thick material provides more insulation. I've had bad luck with mine uh, the past two winters just because um, the bees themselves were not necessarily the best. And uh, I am going to continue to work with horizontal hive configurations. And mine are all made out of inch and a half thick material at a minimum. And the cover's insulated. They're super heavy, two-man lift when it's empty when you first install it. But the beauty of it is, there it sits. It's been through 60 mile an hour plus wind gusts and didn't budge at all and was not strapped down. And that's because the thing is so heavy. So if we're talking about a semi-permanent install, the horizontal hive, top bar hive, long langstroth hive, layens hive, which is less convenient because so many things are not compatible with the layens hive. And I have that out there. Um, but you can insulate it. You don't have to give thought to it the way the commercial reference here is. Everything in a commercial system has to be economical. Well, that's out the door for backyard beekeeping. I mean, if you're going to build something out of mahogany, um, you're already, you've blown your budget. So this is for backyard beekeeping. So you can be as extravagant as you want to be. And uh, the horizontal hive is, is just an example of that. It doesn't matter how much they weigh. What really matters is the weight of the lid. So I also gave thought to those uh, compressed shocks that you have, like you open the tailgate of your, your SUV or whatever, and you've got the shocks on the back that help lift it. 
So when you get into really heavily insulated and heavy wooden stock for those lids and things like that, you might think about assistance like that, where there's a counterweight. I thought about a counterweight on mine that would stick out. It turned out not to need it. So once you get the basics down, build around B space, accommodate deep frames, and also this horizontal hive thing at the Hive Life Conference, they had an extension on the end one that went to medium frames. Going to talk about that too. I thought that was a great idea. But uh, weight doesn't matter. You don't have to ship it. Build it on site. Great idea. So, and if you use a mahogany or redwood or any of these valuable woods, make sure that they have the stamps on them. I have some redwood and had each board is stamped uh, that it was legally harvested. When I was in the Philippines, um, just in the few weeks that I was there, acres of mahogany was harvested by bulldozers. It was astonishing how much of that was moving. So make sure that the wood that you get is sourced legally and responsibly. You know, I'm not trying to be a dictator. I'm just saying, you know, some people are going to look at a big chunk of mahogany or something and just think about where it came from and they, you want to be able to have a clear conscience about it. Question number six, Robert Penn. I'm a new beekeeper as of spring. What three books would you recommend to buy for the new beekeeper? Thanks. Okay, so here's the thing. Uh, it's hard to narrow the field to three books. If you take a beekeeping class, and I hope a lot of you are, by the way, if this is going to be your first year in beekeeping, I hope you're not relying solely on YouTube, although I do understand that some people are so far away they can't find a beekeeping group, a bee association, and you can't all hang out at IHOP the way we did this week. And so books come into play. And uh, usually when you take a class, they hand out a little book, you know, beginning beekeeping. There is beekeeping for dummies. There are lots of books like that. I didn't like personally beekeeping for dummies. Um, when I start looking through a book and I find that a lot of the information is outdated, um, this is not specifically about that title, but uh, the information needs to be really good. And it needs to be the kind of thing that's going to be timeless, that's going to carry you through. So I have three books and a guide to share you with. So we'll actually talk about four. So the cover photo for today is this book. This is what I would recommend, Keeping Honeybees, Stories Guide to Keeping Honeybees. Stories books are around for raising chickens, cattle, you name it. If you're running a farm, any kind of micro farm or agricultural practice, um, you're going to find there's a stories book on it. This is a good one. So that's what I recommend. I'm going to put these links um, in the comment section at, after all the comments. So I'm no longer going to put the links in between the comments anymore because I think that's a challenge for those who are just trying to get to the topics. We're going to put it at the bottom. So start with stories guide. Next one is when you then your you know your your interest is peaked and you just have to know more. Okay, so there's an author that I hope all of you have heard of, Thomas Seeley, and this will thoroughly cover the biology of the honeybee. You need to understand. So this is Tom Seeley's The Lives of Bees, the untold story of the honeybee in the wild. And even though it's about honeybees in the wild, understanding the biology of the bee and what they do and what they do through the year is going to benefit you as you start keeping bees, even though you're doing it in a beehive and you've got an artificial environment and everything else for them. Knowing more about the natural biology of bees will help you align your practices that makes it as, let's say, let's, let's not impede the bees any more than we absolutely have to. So Thomas Seeley's The Lives of Bees. Next... The next thing, and this is, see, the problem is I'm trying to narrow a lot of books. And so I recommend these. These are not the only books, but definitely this is, I was putting together a put book package for somebody that was starting out. Those two are the first starters. Then people want to know, um, how can I expand my apiary? So some people want to add hives and they want to use nucleus colonies and they want to do walk away splits and they want to make their own queens and things like that. This is my number three book. 
Increase Essentials by Lawrence John Connor, and the foreword is by Kim Flottam. So anyway, thin book, widely available. I think all the bee supply stores sell them. I got this one on Amazon. I have highlighted details in here, but everything you want to know about increasing your colonies. Queen sells great pictures in here. So increase essentials when you start to expand your apiary. So this is the next book that I would recommend. Convenient, useful, I don't care how long you've been keeping bees. That's a great book to have. Now, my final book, because you asked for three, this is a pamphlet. So this pamphlet right here, I recommend every beekeeper get. And the reason is, one of the weakest areas for beekeepers, even those who have kept bees for a long time, this is the Bee Informed Partnership, by the way, Diagnosis and Treatment of Common honeybee diseases and this is the second edition so it's been out for a while and just like look at the back of it for example you want to understand what you're looking at when you're inspecting your hives and one of the reasons I really want to push this first of all it supports the bee informed partnership and uh, the other thing is a lot of people are going to be coming into spring and you're gonna have dead outs or you can have issues going on in your hives that you may not understand what you're looking at what is chalk brood what's that look like you know so all these things are partnered with photographs that will show in great detail explain what's going on and also recommend treatment so those are my three books and one extra for the guide there so that's very good and you have to go through the be informed partnership i think you can do a google search for this um i bought mine from them though because I want to support that organization, of course. So that's the end of question six. Question number seven. Bee Lord. In your climate during the springtime, what signs do you look for to start queen rearing and splitting? How early could you start that? One of the books I just mentioned where that would be covered would be this one, Increase Essentials. What do I look for? First thing I'm looking for is surplus drones. If you don't have drones, your queens can't mate. So if I have drones in my apiary and they're starting to put those out, then I know that the drone congregation areas out beyond my apiary where my virgin queens will fly, they will find mating stock out there. If there aren't enough drones yet and the pollen isn't coming in and the nectar flow hasn't started, not a good time for splitting. So if the bees do it themselves, there's not a lot you can do about that. If you fail to expand the colony or something else and your bees swarm, then it's likely that you'll lose them unless you're lucky enough to have a bee tree that they all tend to go to and then you can go and collect those. But uh, if I'm doing splits myself, and I was very good at this last year, staying ahead of that and splitting them just in time, um, I look for drones, I look for rapid buildup inside the colony, I look for at least five or six frames of brood. So, and then of course, pollen outside of that honey stored outside of that so and good bee population so that when you split them uh, you're not of course just destroying two colonies so you end up with a strong colony that you pulled from you created another weren't another word for splitting is to create like an artificial swarm you might be taking away the queen taking away some eggs taking away some capped brood and all the things that they'll need to sustain themselves and now we have a queenless colony where they'll make a new queen and then of course this is part of our swarm control and uh, when this happens early in spring, you get your strongest stock. Uh, that's because we made it through winter. And uh, if they're strong at that point, then that means that they are adapted to your environment. They're doing well and only split from the colonies that you like the traits of. So uh, don't do it just because it's a big colony. Do it because they do the things that you want them to do. And that... Uh, just backyard husbandry right there. That's the end of number seven. Number eight, roach lists. Is there a way to prevent the bees from building comb between the tops of the frames in the brood box and the bottoms of the frames in the super? My bees seem to do this often and it makes a huge mess 
when doing inspections and moving the frames. They all rush to clean up the honey that is spilled from the broken comb, which makes it hard to remove the comb without making them angry. But I also can't just leave it because if I replace the frames, it would squish the bees. Cleaning honey when I do remove it and then they just rebuild it anyway. So, yes, there's a method for that. You can't stop them from building it because it's all about bee space. So if there's a space, three eighths of an inch, that's bee space. That's your sweet spot. So if there's more than three eighths of an inch between frames, so the back of the bottom frame and the bottom of the next frame up, you're going to fill that in with comb and they generally fill it with nectar storage, pollen storage, or drone production. And it is important to have your hive tool with you and it is important to, as you go into your hive, scrape away all this extra comb and put it in a baggie or a bucket or whatever. Collect it because you want it. It's good stuff. You're going to need it. Now, if as soon as you crack it or you go to lift it, you disrupt a bunch of honey cells, <clears throat> depending on the time of year, that can kick off robbing. So it can be a big concern. One of the things you can do to stop that is you break the seal, the propolis seal between the boxes, you give it a twist to the right, and you give it a twist to the left, and then you leave it. That's right. You leave it, and then you go on and you inspect your other hives, you go get coffee, or do whatever else you're gonna do. Because what's happened then is, when you twist them like that, you broke the cells that are between the frames, because this frame went like that, and the bottom frame stayed stationary. So once you disrupt those cells, any of those that have honey in them, which makes the mess we're talking about, uh, the bees are up in there cleaning up the honey. What they're not doing is doing immediate repair, and they're also not immediately replacing the honey in those cells. So they're eating it and relocating it. Then, when you come back after a couple of hours, so then you lift it off, and now look, no big honey mess, and no increased risk of robbing. So that little twist to break those cells up between the boxes, then leaving them alone, Often you find, too, that on the inside of your inner cover, you'll find that on the back of the top frames in the top box, that is all, often that's full of honey. Same thing up there. Break the inner cover seal, give it the twist, go away. But if you're willing to deal with it, just open it up and, of course, scrape it off and deal. But then you've got bees in the honey and everything else, so that's one method that works and you can't be in a rush. And again... That applies to backyard beekeeping because you're not on a schedule. You got a few hives. So when you have a few hives, you can take your time and do things like that. But other than that, so that below 3 8 they can seal it with propolis. Bigger than 3 8 that's when they start filling with burr comb. Kate Crawley, this is question number nine. Uh, my daughter has a nuke ordered for May. We're in Minnesota as a short woman and not looking forward to lifting heavy boxes when she's away at college. And in a cold climate, we had hoped to marry a flow super or frames to a super insulated horizontal hive. I've seen one on the East Coast, but he had hive collapse in it. And it was his first year. Has anyone done it successfully? Otherwise, we plan to use an 8 or 9 Lysen 3-frame polystyrene kit from Better B. Thoughts? Okay, so here's the thing. We've already mentioned this guy. I'm going to put a link down in the video description. And remember, the links will be below all the questions. There is a Horizontal Hive manufacturer that was at the Hive Live conference who makes this set up that you're describing that had flow frames in it. So uh, that's covered and you can ask them questions and of course there might be feedback and things like that from others who have done it. I'm not personally a huge fan of putting in the flow frames in a horizontal hive configuration and for several reasons. But one is you have to be able to tip the frames back to harvest. The other thing is, the bees are moving horizontally through the frames. Let's say this is a flow frame, and it is. This is the end of your inside of your box for your horizontal hive. This is the inside of your box for your horizontal hive. 
where are the bees moving? They have to move under or they have to move up over the top. So the way these are made, they don't provide a lot of space so that the bees can get up over the top, but uh, they can't go through. There won't be holes in travel spaces. But the whole hive now, when it comes time to harvest, the entire hive will have to tip back two degrees. Now the manufacturer of the horizontal hives, he does custom work too. I asked him specifically about that. He says, well, they'll tip the, they'll tip the box. But I don't know of anyone who's been successful. Uh, there may be somebody, if you're a viewer and uh, you've got a horizontal hive configuration and you've been successful with low frames in it, please write in the comment section below this video and share or put a link to a video that shows it, how it works, and then we'll see how that goes. But the three medium polystyrene kits from Better Bee for a, for a permanent setup for a beehive, I would not personally recommend. These smaller hive configurations, nuclear si nucleus sized hives, uh, they just get overpopulated so fast. They just don't, it's not a good long term solution to that. But the horizontal hive would be cool. I just wonder how married you are to the idea of using flow frames specifically. The next question, second half of question number nine here is, we have had an influx of cicada killer wasps the last few years. Will they be a problem? Best regards. So here's the thing, cicada killers, what are they? And when I've talked about the Asian giant hornet, and around here we have the European hornet, which is uh, Vespa crabro, and uh, of course the giant hornet in the United States right now, the largest hornet in the world is uh, Vespa mandarinia, and that is the Asian giant hornet. Some people will send me a picture and go, this is bigger than what you described, it's bigger than all of them, it's got to be the one. Usually they send me a picture of the very distinctive cicada killer. Cicada killer is a wasp, it's not a hornet. So it's a classification difference, a species difference. So one of the things though, as far as being a, a challenge for your bees, is cicada killer. That kind of identifies what its target food resource is. The good news about the cicada killer is that uh, they're not a communal wasp. They're not social like honeybees. Sometimes you can get the idea or misunderstand they can appear communal because they'll all be coming out of like the same area where they've all wintered over. But they're considered a solitary wasp. And they're little tunnels that they dig and they're very good at digging can go several feet underground. Uh, they're startling. They're alarming. People see them. And the ones that fly at you uh, learn a little bit, by the way, about these wasps. Because as a beekeeper, I'm often really surprised by how little beekeepers know about other species of bees even, which could be, of course, the solitary bees, uh, wild native bees, and then, of course, wasp and hornet species that are out there. I would love it if backyard beekeepers expanded their awareness to other species because sometimes people will call and say, I've got honeybees in my shed and did you want them? And you go to get them and they're bald face hornets. So having an expanded knowledge of other animals in your area that are insects and that sting, uh, you'll be better equipped to deal with environmental stresses for your bees and you'll also be able to help inform the general public and I think that's valuable. So the cicada killer gets thrown at me a lot, not physically, but you know, this is this is the giant killer hornet or something. The other thing that's interesting about them, not a threat to your bees, by the way, and uh, the male cicada killer is also big. The cicada killer can be two inches long, so we're talking, it's big. The male can challenge you and uh, people can flip out about it. And here's where knowledge kicks in. Just like the uh, carpenter bees, so the bumblebees that chew into all your unfinished wood and into the soffits of your buildings and things like that. There's a, a big fat male with a yellow square on its head that comes gets right in your face. And that freaks people out because uh, they assume it can sting you and it can't. That's what's cool about it. You can barehanded, slap that thing right out of the air, and then, you know, just show how brave you are. But uh, the male 
Cicada Killer does the same thing. It's very aggressive, it's defensive, it's a guardian, and of course it wants to mate with female Cicada Killers. And likewise, it has no stinger. So you can you know, just snap him right out of the air too. They have a tendency to do what some uh, worker bees do, which is when you get in the bee yard and they don't want you around, you can get that headbutt where the bee bounces off your forehead and you think it's a clumsy bee. But you should listen to the frequency of those wing beats. Warning you away, but the cicada killer, as interesting as they are, as dramatic as they are, not a threat to your bees. Even if it ate a couple bees, you know, they, they catch their prey, which would normally be a cicada, of course. And they'll get a hold of cicada, which is a huge insect itself. And they often have to drag it back to their nest because they, like, they fly or try to fly with them. And they just keep falling on the ground. And so uh, that's their target because they want to lay eggs in it. And they want their larvae to hatch out and feed on that. And a little honeybee isn't going to provide much of a resource for them. So... Hope that answered that question. Question number 10, Rebecca Logan, South Carolina. I'm setting up a bee yard for my teenage grandson. We're newbies. Would it be beneficial to cover the ground with a very large, heavy-duty tarp before setting up the hives? That's good prior planning, by the way. So, when you're sighting your bees, this is good when you're brand new, look at the grade of the land, avoid low areas, avoid damp areas, avoid strong wind zones. Then we look at facility. So in other words, how available will the spot be for you to go and attend to your bees? So don't put them right up against the building. You want to be able to walk behind everything and uh, get around your hives all the way and think about your personal comfort when observing your bees. So those are all things that are very important when you're picking where your beehive's going to be. The next part is what's the substrate like? And there's something called landscape cloth. So you could in fact dig out some of the topsoil, put down landscape cloth which will keep the weeds under control and keep grass from growing directly under your hives. And then you can put gravel over that and one of the reasons that you might want to do this uh, a couple of reasons actually skunks if you have them uh, according to some people they say skunks need to roll bees in the grass to kill them so they can eat them so in other words if there's no grass if it's gravel and things like that it can deter skunks i don't know that 100 percent. that's just what's been shared by other people so the other thing is when you put down gravel you produce a soil situation where one can't leave your hives and pupate in the soil underneath of it. So aside from the convenience of not having to weed whack your hives and stands, now we've cut down on small hive beetle larvae getting into the ground, pupating and coming back up. But then, because this was a lecture I attended about that, and that was a recommendation being made to stop small hive beetle larvae, but the whole thing was Jamie Ellis did a whole thing about small hive beetles uh, where the larvae went out of a building and across a parking lot before they found the soil that they wanted and then they entered the soil of pupae. So as a small hive beetle larvae control, it doesn't do diddly. So I think though uh, the best advantage of that is that you won't have to weed whack around your beehives. And then if you're in a real hot area, we want to, of course, not use mulch maybe, but use gravel or things like that on top of them. And it could be limestone gravel, white. And then uh, it would have a cooling effect. So landscape cloth is good because rain goes through it, of course, and we don't want any ponding. So yeah, just make sure that uh, water gets through it and that it's good for your bees and handy for you. So... <clears throat> Yeah, you could do that. Question number 11, Robert Hunt. Marshall, Missouri. Will the bees, will the bee smart inner cover go over a flow super? Nope. <clears throat> this is the bee smart designs insulated inner cover. 
these are the little spikes that have to align on the corners and when i put this on the flow hives these spikes do not line up so what's the solution you clip these off i take a wood chisel and i chisel off uh, all the spikes on one side then i put it on the uh, the hive and now it fits so it'll sit on there and then the bees did a great job of sealing up underneath with propolis so it worked that way i have them on flow hives i have those insulated inner covers on all of my langstroth <clears throat> hive configurations this year but you have to chip off those little pegs that are sticking down and they chip off pretty easy so that's an easy answer there but a frequent question and that goes for any uh, hive configuration that they don't seem to sit on just right so question number 12, Stephen Allen, Cambridge, Ontario, Canada. I understand the uses of one-to-one -one and two-to-one syrup. I understand that early feeding will induce brood rearing, which may be detrimental to the hive. Now, by the way, that early feeding that would potentially cause them to rear brood is not the liquid syrup. That's feeding proteins that include pollen, for example. My question is, when placing a sugar brick for winter feeding, the humidity helps to turn the brick into a syrup. The bees can lap up, and wouldn't it just be akin to simply feeding syrup? No, they're very different. In fact, they use the condensation that's already occurring in the hive uh, to liquefy the syrup. So it's not that the syrup or that the, <clears throat> the sugar brick or your sugar that's stored for emergency resources for your bees it doesn't liquefy on its own. It actually solidifies from that condensation in there. But the bees use the water that's occurring inside the hive through condensation in winter. And they're using that to metabolize the solid um, sugar that you've offered up there. So my question is, when placing a sugar brick for winter feeding, <clears throat> I'm sorry, would this be akin to simply feeding syrup? On a related note, what if the winter feeding were done via a baggy feeder? and the syrup were perhaps four to one or even higher concentration. I've never seen anyone be able to mix a four to one uh, sugar syrup. Two to one, three to one would be really pushing it. So anyway, considering that this is Ontario, Canada, I would not recommend liquid feeding in winter. So one of the things that this baggy decision <clears throat> or the consideration here, I'm going to talk about the same thing everybody's talking about this year. Uh, fondant, why not just put this on there? If you were in a really cold climate, uh, I would put fondant on. It's already contained in the baggie. It is not a liquid, so it is actually better for the same reason that I described early on, kind of a trickle feed. A constant source is available if they need it. And uh, the bees are bypassing their honey to use this stuff, but they're also not overdoing it. So this is like a lifeline for your bees, which is what supplemental feeding is all about. But as far as two to one and things like that, in winter time, I would not put that on there. And I don't know <clears throat> that this high sugar concentration of four to one, I don't know that that's even achievable. So I would stick with sugar bricks, uh, dry sugar offerings, mountain camp method, which is where they pour that right on top of newsprint, right on the back of your frames, and assuming that you've got the space above that to accommodate it. Or fondants, whether you make it yourself, <clears throat> this happens to be Hive Alive fondant. And uh, that, of course, has proprietary um, ingredients that help your bees reduce nosema. So that's my answer to that. I would not put a wet feed a syrup in there uh, and I understand the baggies that you're talking about Ziploc baggie with syrup in it you, you put little holes in it and the bees feed on that again for a cold area in winter time me personally that's not what I would put in the hive question number 13 Diane from Fisherville Kentucky do you have any tricks on how to replenish dry sugar in the rapid rounds when a large amount of bees are in eating away I don't want to wait for it to just run out using it for your condensation capture. Note, every time I check, um, afternoon, dusk, bees are in it. Okay, <clears throat> you're on man. 
I don't have my vacuum cleaner. Be right back. Okay, so this is it. This is what I use. When it comes to battery powered vacuum cleaners, this really sucks as a vacuum cleaner, which is what you want a vacuum cleaner to do, but it doesn't do it very well. Which is why this Shark Ultra Cyclone, and I marked it for bees only, uh, they're battery powered. You take this out to your apiary. And this works on my horizontal hive too, by the way. When the bees are up at the top and you just can't get them to get out of there and you're wanting to close things up, I turn this thing on. They're actually not very noisy. And you suck the bees right off into this little capsule. But what I do when I'm looking at a wrap it around, yellow just shows up better. As soon as I open up, so all your sugar's in here, this cap is not in for wintertime, so this whole thing's full of sugar. So the first thing I do when I open it up is I put the cap inverted right on top, and that keeps other bees from coming up through the central column because they're also losing their heat-stored uh, capsule in there. So then you've got your live bees on the sugar that you want to get rid of, so then you take this and you suck them all off of there, and they go out of your rapid round feeder and they go into this little capsule right here. And then there's a little release button right here and you open this up after you've replenished the sugar and filled it back up. Then you shake these bees out onto it. You take this cover away, put this cover back on and then you're out of there. That's it. That's what I do. So I use a little battery powered portable vacuum. Anytime you have bees where you don't want them, use that thing. If you're trying to get back to the house and you've got that one bee that's stuck on the side of your veil and you can't get rid of it or they're on your neck or whatever, same thing. Then you just open it up and shake them out and they're good to go. So any portable bee vac, it's not actually sold as a bee vac, but that's what I use it for because zero harm to the bees. And if you get a bunch of them and it's summertime, for whatever reason you had to suck up a bunch of bees, what I like to do is open this, lean it right against the hive and just have this by the landing board. And then these bees walk out and go back inside the hive because nurse bees can't find their way home. Anyway, that's what I do. <clears throat> Fourteen, Paul Wilson, South Carolina. Egg zone eight. Must be nice. Nice and warm there. My hives are built, stained, varnished, and ready to go. Should I place them in the yard now to weather or wait until the bees arrive? The family and I appreciate your channel. Thank you so much. Here's the thing. Yeah, go ahead and put them out. If you've got hives, this is a great time of year, by the way. A lot of people do this in their basements and things like that. Configure your hive equipment, get your paint and finishes on and things like that. There's nothing wrong with pre-staging and getting them out there and ready. Because a couple of things happen outside. One, it starts to smell like the outside. I think that's good. Better than brand new, fresh out of the woodshed or the varnishes and finishes, whatever you've used on them. It gives that all a chance to dissipate, gets rained on, dried out, so it starts to smell more like uh, something that bees would occupy. So when you're brand new, yeah, go ahead and I would go ahead and put them out and get it staged. And as we mentioned before, pick the site just right for where they're going to be. And then once you put your bees in, you'll be good to go. And uh, I hope you'll tell us how that went. <clears throat> so yeah, go ahead and put them out. That's what I would do. And question number 15, last question of the day. I'm sorry if I did not get to your question and uh, I just didn't want this to go on forever and ever. This is from Edith, Anderson, South Carolina. I have a hive with that lost its queen while I was at the Hive Life Conference. Could I use QPH, the queen pheromone? So I don't think it's QPH, I think it's QMP which is queen mandibular pheromone. And it says, could I use that uh, to make them think there's a queen during winter? All right, I'm gonna explain that a little bit. <clears throat> Here we are, January, and your queen's already lost. I'm curious kind of how that was determined, by the way. 
Uh, but let's say the queen is lost. Queen mandibular pheromone, which works very well, by the way. And you might be saying, where can I get that? That comes from Better Bee. But it's not really prominent in their list of uh, resources on their site. So you almost have to ask for it. I keep it in the freezer. I always have it handy. What does it do? When you put that, it's a little semi-clear noodle that goes in there and it's got synthetic queen manipular pheromone. And what it does is it suppresses the reproductive instincts of your bees. Because we know that the worker bees are females, they have ovaries, and in the absence of a queen, those, uh, the absence of those pheromones, then they activate their own reproductive system. And uh, that usually occurs about the third week of being absent of having no queen, new pheromone being introduced into that colony. So it serves as a placeholder to keep them from doing that. Now, the problem is wintertime, those bees are going to continue to just die out because we don't have anything replacing them. Uh, so, you know, you would be keeping them from creating drone brood and things like that, which is what laying workers do. Then, uh, but it's not going to replace the queen. Um, so then if you're just buying time, hoping that uh, you can get in a laying queen, a replacement queen, and put that in there, that's your only hope for that colony. Unless you have another colony that you could actually combine them with when you get a nice warm weather break and being in that climate, you might get that. Um, if you have another colony, I would consider combining them. The chances of getting a new queen now would be hard and having the queen manipular pheromone in there um, would only keep them from becoming laying workers and of course then becoming resistant to the introduction of a new queen which is its purpose it's to make them think a queen is there so there are no laying workers and then you remove that 72 hours before installing a new queen so that's what that's intended for i think your colony would just eventually die out on its own um, this time of year being queenless but i'm curious how they ended up queenless to begin with that was the last question for today's video so I just want to remind you, this is the fluff section. So just that uh, I am going to put out a video about the Hive Live conference. Had a great time there. And many thanks to Cayman Reynolds, of course, for hosting us there. And of course, for being sponsored by this uh, <clears throat> Guardian Bee Apparel fencing hood is what uh, this veil back here is from Guardian Bee Apparel that you always see here. They sponsored me for that, so I'm very grateful that uh, I was covered to go there. Don't forget to go out and clean your hive entrances, your landing boards, because there's going to be a lot of activity, and when the bees are flying, or when it warms up enough that they could fly, and if they can't get out, they'll be dying inside, or they'll be eliminating inside and polluting the interior of the hive. So entrances have to be clear. The other thing is for some people that might be putting out warm, putting out feed for the bees, uh, during these early breaks when we get these uh, summer-like weekends and things like that, you can put out open feed for your bees. The only syrup, because we talked about heavy syrups today, the only syrup I would put out for them would be Pro Sweet, full strength. And uh, because they will utilize that, they're not going to store it. These are going to be bringing in emergency resources until the flowers and things in your area ultimately kick in. But remember that if you warm it up to about 70 degrees, they get many more flights to and from that resource, where if it stays at, let's say, 50 degrees, uh, 10 to 1 reduction in how much of that they're going to get back to their hives in the time that the, uh, the flying temperatures are prime for them. And there will be links at the bottom, as I mentioned before. And thanks for watching. And don't forget to click like down below so that you'll know that you've seen this. And post your own questions and comments. There will be other links. I'm glad that you spent your time with me here today. If you came up and said hello to me at the Hive Live conference, thank you so much for doing that. It means a lot. And I hope you appreciated today's video. So until next time, have a great weekend.